All right. Good evening. My name is Suhail Khader. I'm one of the organizers of SITSA India 2020, the National Conference on Citizen Science for Biodiversity. Uh, it's a great honor and a pleasure to introduce this evening's uh, keynote speaker to all of you. Karen Cooper is Associate Professor of Forestry and Environmental Resources at North Carolina State University and is also Assistant Head of the Biodiversity Research Lab at the North Carolina Museum of Natural, Resources, uh, Natural Sciences. Pardon me. She studies bird ecology, conservation, and management through the use of citizen science. Karen is also co-editor-in-chief of the journal Citizen Science Theory and Practice and is author of the book Citizen Science, How Ordinary People Are Changing the Face of Discovery. Karen advocates for the uh, practices of citizen science, open science, and science communication. Uh, she pursues scholarly, uh, scholarly inquiry into these areas and brings them all together to achieve public science. She's dedicated to training and mentoring students to become public scientists so that they can pursue careers that weave science into the fabric of society. And uh, through the years, Karen has been a pioneer in both the theory and practice of citizen science. And we are very lucky to have her here for Biodiversity India. Thank you, Karen, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Suhail. Thanks for that introduction. And it's really, I'm quite honored to be speaking with you all this evening about citizen science. I, I always enjoy talking about citizen science, especially with people with similar interests. Um, and it's fabulous to see such energy around um, the role of citizen science in biodiversity conservation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and I've, uh, I've included, um, <laughs> well, pictures of my, my book and my most current uh, book, A Field Guide to Citizen Science, in case you're interested. Um, but I have this quote here by uh, a comedian, a US uh, comedian, Lily Tomlin, um, because I feel like it, it sort of exemplifies how I feel about citizen science. It says, I always, <laughs> hold on, let me move my, my picture here. I always wondered why somebody doesn't do something about that. And then I realized I was somebody. And I feel like that's how it is with citizen science. It's that it gives everyone a chance to count, to be somebody who's doing something about something they care about. Um, and then let's see here. Oops, sorry. Um, in order to share my perspectives about citizen science, uh, really, which will be a US centric perspective, but I really have to tell many stories because there's so many dimensions and um, aspects to citizen science. And so I'll tell a few stories that illustrate the different styles, but hopefully you'll see a common theme, these common themes throughout all these sort of little stories. And the main one is, is that citizen science is a system of knowledge production. And so I hope that in, as we look at citizen science, it'll challenge you to think differently about knowledge production, about where that happens, about who is involved, <clears throat> about how it takes place, and ultimately about who that serves. And that what we'll see is that at its core, citizen science is about opening up systems of knowledge production in ways that build social capital so that then people can use that knowledge for conservation, for environmental justice, for other kinds of, um, of ways that we can take care of our planet. And <clears throat> so that it's really this sort of changing from science to a type of public science. So to begin, my field is really uh, in, uh, my academic home discipline is ornithology. So I wanna start with an example, hopefully familiar to many, which is eBird. <clears throat> and in, uh, these animated graphics were produced um, from, from the contributions of thousands of bird watchers who collectively have submitted millions of observations to eBird. And they show, um, this one is indigo bunting migration. Um, and, and these are more up to date than any field guide. <laughs> the data have been used um, 
to inform scientific publications. There's over 100 scientific uh, peer-reviewed papers from the eBird database. The data are used by managers to make decisions on the ground about how to manage habitat for birds. And the data are used by bird watchers to decide where they want to go bird watching. So there's um, so that collective action, um, anyway, up one of the themes that I want to emphasize, which is we often, I often anyway, talk about citizen science as though it's a collaboration between scientists and the public, but it's actually highly interdisciplinary, right? It requires biologists, yes, and volunteers, but also social scientists, people who study human computer interactions, web developers, um, people in information sciences, computer sciences, all kinds of things for managing these sorts of data. Um, and so one of the things I like to emphasize is that even though it involves volunteers and data contributions from volunteers, it's not free, right? So uh, we have a phrase here which says, well, it's free like puppies. Like someone might, you might be gifted a, a pet, a cat or a dog, but it's not like that's free because there's vet bills, there's food, there's all kinds of things associated with it. And it's the same with the citizen science project. There's a lot of effort that goes into managing volunteers and also a lot of energy and expertise that goes into managing a big data set. So it's definitely cost effective, but it's, it's also not free. I think that's an important thing to recognize. Um, one of the other misconceptions oftentimes is that it's new and that these kind of maps and all that are possible because of, um, because of the internet and smartphones. And certainly technology lends a hand in these kinds of projects. But one thing I like to point out is that it's actually very old. Um, and here's one example. These are, uh, you know, it's not an animated map, of course, but if we look at this, it's a chart of whale distribution. And it's from 1851, and it's hard to see it, but it's um, it's actually showing the seasonal patterns, the seasonal migrations of right whales and sperm whales in the oceans. So it's 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 really the same sort of data that's in eBird, but it was for whales. And this was um, Matthew Mowry was in the Navy at the time, who was uh, crowdsourcing this information from sailors, and it's actually mentioned as a footnote in the novel Moby Dick. And they describe this chart, um, just saying it divides the ocean into districts of five degrees by latitude and five degrees by longitude. Perpendicular in each district, there's these columns, one for every month. And in that is how many, uh, how many um, days that were spent, uh, like potentially observing whales, and then how many of the different types of whales. Um, Anyway, which is just to say that this type of system of crowdsourcing um, is certainly very old. Um, <clears throat> so what is citizen science? Just to give a little context here in the United States, um, we now have a definition of citizen science that is incorporated into our federal law. And it's in um, what's called our US Competes Act, which is an enormous act that's um, renewed periodically. And in the most recent version, which happened just before Obama left office, was this definition was added. And here's how it defines citizen science as a form of open collaboration in which individuals or organizations participate voluntarily in scientific process in various ways. And that can include enabling and formulating the research question, creating and refining project design, conducting scientific experiments. I think the one we think about most is collecting and analyzing data, particularly collecting data, but also interpreting the results of data, developing technologies and applications, making discoveries and solving problems. So the definition here of citizen science encompasses a wide array of activities and ways that the public might be involved. And what we see are many, many different styles of citizen science. And I've put them here on these axes, just sort of a volunteer investment and how geographically distributed the network might be. On one end, 
is distributed computing or crowdsourcing like online micro tasks, which has very low investment. It's very simple to do and can be done by people all over the world. And then at the other end of the spectrum, totally high volunteer investment is do it yourself, right? Doing every aspect yourself. It's often very localized. And then in between there's so many different things of participatory mapping, community-based research, all kinds of, of different aspects. And we'll review some different examples. Um, <clears throat> and what we see now is that it's in so many different fields are incorporating citizen science in order to make progress in different ways, including across all sorts of areas of ecology and areas relevant to biodiversity conservation. Um, and to support that, there's also a lot of disciplines that are studying the practice of citizen science, right? Like I mentioned earlier, human computer interactions, environmental education, um, com information sciences, science and technology studies, all these disciplines are helping us understand the phenomenon of citizen science and develop best practices. And so around that, there has been a growth of professional associations of the practitioners involved in citizen science coming together from different core disciplines um, to develop best practices, right? So there's the Citizen Science Association is based in the United States. There's a European Citizen Science Association, an Australian Citizen Science Association. There is Citizen Science Asia, currently, I think, based um, in Hong Kong. And then there's a new association, um, the Ibero-American um, Network for um, Participatory Sciences, which covers um, the places that were colonized by the Spanish and the Portuguese. So the Central and South America. Um, and then we also in the US have a federal community of practice for crowdsourcing and citizen science. And um, anyway, and these efforts are really helping uh, improve the practices of citizen science and the impact that it can have. Um, but I just wanted to look at how we got here. <laughs> and again, like sort of revisit this, uh, this idea of of citizen science being very old, but having really recent growth and uptake and just being very much on the rise and to look at why that is. And um, so here's just my uh, timeline in my discipline again, going back to ornithology. We can see citizen science projects that started in the late 1800s. Um, although the most well-known one here started in 1900, which is the Christmas bird count. Um, but you can see that there's this more recent boom of just within ornithology of citizen science projects. And um, if we look at why, um, well, I can say there was this lull in uh, the 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, which was shortly after ornithology became a profession. In the US, there was a, a move towards um, uh, sort of um, studying things at the cellular level and not much funding for organismal types of studies. So a lot of what was happening in ornithology in those decades was amateur ornithologists and who were part of our professional associations. They were always in the beginning, a mix of professionals and amateurs. Um, but what enabled the Christmas bird count? There was really two phenomena. And one was, yes, binoculars became more affordable um, up until then, people would shoot birds to be able to hold them in their hand and identify them. Um, but now people could watch them through binoculars. But it was also that there was a big concern for conservation. Um, fed, birds were put in, were in hats. Fed, there was a big feather plume industry. And so there was conservation concern. That, and it was those technology and social factors that really gave rise to Chris, the Christmas bird count. And if we look at this other boom in citizen science, you can see here, this is the advent really of the World Wide Web of Web 2.0 technologies. But you can see citizen science started in ornithology, that boom started before the web. And it was really here in the 60s after the publication of Silent Spring by Rachel Carson, which was the impetus of our um, modern environmental movement. And I think that that social movement is really what sparked a lot of citizen science. 
Um, and there was also, there's a recent uptick in citizen science, certainly enabled by technology, and also of online citizen science projects that are part of this fourth paradigm of science, which is data intensive, big data technologies. Um, and so there's a lot of, so much data out there that there's a lot of projects where people are helping contribute um, in processing those data. Um, but just to go back even deeper in the timeline, I want to return to uh, Matthew Mowry Fontaine, or Fontaine Mowry, the one who had the whale charts. What he's most famous for, actually, are these charts, which are of, um, of the ocean, wind, and currents. Right? So uh, what was written, uh, what he wrote um, to the, one of the former presidents was, what he wanted was to, to generalize the experience of navigators in such a manner that each may have before him at a glance the experience of all. So what he was doing was crowdsourcing observations from all ships that were at sea and, um, and taking that to create these, this collective knowledge. Um, and he had participants who used his specialized logbooks, right? These sailors were already taking measurements of the current and of the winds, but he had specialized logbooks that they used um, so that that information was easily accessible and standardized. And he had sailors from 13 different countries who were participating in this. And, um, and periodically he'd roll out new charts. And it's because it made sailing safer and faster for everyone. As one participant put it, they said, until I took up your work, I had been traversing the ocean blindfolded. And that's how I think about scientific discovery. It's all there. We just can't see these patterns and we can't understand it until we remove those blindfolds. And so the entire field of oceanography was started from this project um, because how could we ever come to understand the ocean other than through this type of citizen science activity and crowdsourcing observations together. Um, but what I like to emphasize here is that this project was structured in such a way that everybody benefited from the men on the lower deck to the captain to the navigator, right? Because they literally were all in the same boat. Um, and the data and these charts were available to everyone. And so I just want to contrast that with another project that was done by a white Victorian era uh, man, um, William Hewell. And it was also dealt with the oceans, but it was very different. Um, he was interested in the tides and he wanted to draw these co-tidal lines um, to understand, uh, well, really to be able to predict the tides in places where no one had yet measured them. Um, and so he was funded by the Royal Navy right, because they wanted uh, to be able to um, trade and colonize in different places. Um, and so in 1835, he organized an experiment that lasted for two weeks. And he had 650 different stations on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, um, where volunteers were set to measure the level of the tide every 15 minutes at the exact same points in time, every 15 minutes, day and night for two weeks straight. So when that was completed, which was a feat in and of itself, it's a definite Royal Navy kind of feat to organize that level of uh, synchrony, um, but that meant he had returned to him almost 800,000 observations. <laughs> this is well before our type of computers. He had computers who were men who knew calculus. Um, and he, he called all of these people uh, who participated. He didn't, of course, there was not the term citizen scientist. There wasn't even yet the term scientist. Um, he called them, oops, sorry. He called them uh, his subordinate laborers, which didn't, <laughs> didn't catch on. But he was he was, Ewell is known for being the person who coined a lot of terms. People would go to him to, for terms in particular. Um, anyway, and he actually did end up coining the term scientist. Uh, and first he used the term scientist uh, because he didn't want to call Mary Somerville a man of science, 
which is what there at Oxford everyone was referred to as. So he said that she was not a man of science, but she was a scientist. So the first, the first scientist was actually a woman. I don't know really how she felt about it, um, but we can guess. And um, anyway, but a year later, he decided that there was a better use for the term. And he made this statement um, and he said, as there's this term artist, you know, and that can be used to refer to a musician, a painter, a poet. So let's use the term scientist to refer to a mathematicians, physicists, um, and other kind of, you know, all the different types of scientific disciplines that were arising. But it was still a few decades before it became commonly used. But the things to note about Ewell's work is that he earned a Royal Medal for that work. He aided the Royal Navy, benefited uh, from his work. Um, but the people involved in many ways did not benefit. Up until that point, um, families had traditions of keeping track of the tides and writing those into books um, that they would sell to sailors and others. Um, and that was like a form of local knowledge that was passed down through families um, that then was became obsolete and replaced by uh, these maps or the by the science that Hewell was providing. Um, oh, <laughs> so I just wanted to switch gears a little to look at, um, I guess, the context of US history, just to provide a little framing for how where we are with our environmental movements and our citizen science. And so the US also, you know, was colonized. And um, around that same time that Maori and Ewell were carrying out these citizen science projects, the US was experiencing its westward expansion and fulfilling what was seen as our uh, manifest destiny. This is a famous uh, painting related to that westward expansion and the belief that um, it was the colonizers destiny to live um, and civilize this continent. Um, and, uh, and so that, with that came this idea that places that were civilized didn't have, around where people lived, didn't have nature, and that where there was nature, um, there was not people. And so our national parks were formed by removing the indigenous people from them, um, and all of the protected lands were, were created that way of of removing indigenous peoples from those places and cultivating this notion that nature was separate and protected, but it didn't have people and the places that we lived in the cities didn't have nature. Um, which meant, you know, anyway, and that's a lot of the stage for our environmental movements. <clears throat> we also in this country, just to set the stage, and this is again, US centric, um, but we have a legacy not only of colonization and uh, what that meant for our indigenous people, but also a history of slavery and a legacy then of what that means for this country. And what it means, um, you can see in this map on the left of the US, means that, um, that most of the population um, of uh, African Americans, descendants of slaves um, is in the Southern United States. Um, and then even within the states, it's highly segregated. And then even if you go to the city level, which is what this examples are on the right, there's, there's even further segregation um, between where uh, black people live and where white people live. Um, the one on the top is Detroit, which has a, a, a road that is that dividing boundary. Um, and the one on the bottom is uh, Baltimore, which is called the, the butterfly, <laughs> um, which is where uh, in the wings are where are predominantly black neighborhoods and the um, body of that butterfly is predominantly white. And I'm mentioning this because this shapes our environmental movement, which in turn we see shaping our citizen science movements. Um, so because of the segregation at all of these spatial scales from national to state to city, 
um, what it enables is environmental quality and environmental health um, that really differs from, uh, has follows these spatial patterns. Um, and so what's arisen here are two very different environmental movements. One that is like a, a wildlife conservation, um, nature protection sort of movement that's very mainstream uh, and white um, about protecting nature in this kind of way that it's separate, but it involves a lot of environmental education to reconnect people with nature and make them care. And then there's um, an environmental movement for those who are marginalized, whether it's indigenous or black or other people of color, and also whites who are of very low wealth. And, um, and so, uh, and that is really fostered what's known as an environmental justice movement, which is focused on the relationship between people and our environment. And what's I think fascinating is that these two environmental movements are also reflected in our citizen science programs. And so although there's many types of citizen science, there's, um, it's along the spectrum of sort of this crowd-based, very top-down that, um, that dovetails really well with our mainstream conservation efforts like um, eBird and iNaturalist. And then there's other citizen science that's very community-driven, very local, grassroots, that actually supports this other environmental movement of environmental justice. And, um, and what I wanna emphasize is that we, that my hope is to find ways to bring these together um, to be mutually supporting. Cause it's really ultimately all about the same goal, which is how do we come together and collectively act as stewards of this planet? Um, so I'm just going to give a few stories, like I said, a few examples, um, like with our sort of biodiversity conservation projects. Uh, um, one here is the Lost Ladybug Project, which was about this nine spotted ladybug that had been rapidly declining and scientists couldn't find it in any of its core range. So they put out a call. And this is one area where citizens can help to have eyes everywhere. And actually it was kids that really jumped on board this project. And this young girl here shown with her mom, those mugs they are holding are filled with nine spotted ladybugs. And they found them at Oregon. They brought them back in for studies in the lab and breeding and eventually um, to be releasing in more places. Um, and then on the right, <laughs> I'm showing a very old man, but he actually started when he was young. He started when he was 18 monitoring this weather station and continued until he died at age 103. He's 101 in this picture. And that's with one of our oldest um, citizen science projects, which is uh, weather observing stations. Um, and, uh, and so most of our climate data in the US come from these kinds of stations. Um, anyway, so our, uh, just those are a couple of examples of people of all different ages, um, crowdsourcing, right? Being part of crowdsourcing efforts. Um, even online, we're seeing this in ecology and biodiversity, right? So museums are digitizing specimens. Mark My Bird was a project where um, they were three, three dimensionally digitizing specimens and crowdsourcing the effort of, um, of digitizing those more carefully. Uh, the North American Bird Phenology Project has all these old paper records of bird migration and they have a website where people transcribe those texts, right? So there's a lot of citizen science helping biodiversity in that way with these small online tasks. Um, and then just, uh, there's also projects um, like the Belly Button Biodiversity Project, studying the hygiene hypothesis of why, why we have more autoimmune diseases now and um, allergies, which might be related to losing the diversity in our microbiome, um, like even on our surface microbiome, on our bodies. Um, anyway, this, this project sampled belly buttons, our navels, uh, thinking those got washed the least, found enormous biodiversity. Um, they had initial hypotheses about what might relate to that. None of them made, none of them explained the diversity. 
Um, one later came up related to pets, going back to dogs. People with dogs have different microbiomes than those without. Um, but anyway, they opened up that data set to the public and they crowdsourced for hypotheses to drive that research forward. And people came up with all kinds of creative ideas about what might explain the diversity that's being seen um, in our microbiome. And so that just gets at um, all these different ways and sometimes unexpected ways that, that the public can contribute to scientific research beyond just the data, beyond just a sample, but also contributing their minds towards these kind of problems. Um, and then I have an example that kind of crosses these boundaries. This was a study in North Carolina um, and the, some of the Southern states looking at the population genetic structure of a threatened species, the loggerhead sea turtle. And in this, our state agency, our wildlife management agency, um, recruited about 700 volunteers along our coast to make sure that our beaches were monitored for sea turtle nesting. And when they would find a nest, they would fence it off, keep it protected. If it seemed in danger of inundation, um, the volunteers might relocate the nests. Um, and in these patrols of the beach, what the volunteers found was that there was so much trash on the beach. And so actually, while they were still doing citizen science for this agency and as part of this top-down effort, they actually also formed their own grassroots citizen science related to trash and, um, and reporting the trash, uh, which then nobody believed their data, which is a problem in citizen science. And so what they started to do was photo document it Right, so they had to increase their rigor of their scientific process and their documentation and data quality. And so every piece of trash they pick up now, they don't just dispose of it, they take it home, they rinse it, they sort it, they take a photograph. And then they got people to believe them. They realized the impact that of plastics um, and they uh, it mobilized people around that knowledge to start um, pressuring local businesses to stop using single-use plastics, for people to make a change in their lifestyles to stop using single-use plastics, um, and all those kind of things that help uh, help people be better stewards of their environment. And then I have uh, uh, one more example, I guess two more maybe, that I want to cover that are more grassroots, even starting as grassroots kind of projects. Um, and this one is in Tonawanda, New York, with the three people on the left. Um, and they live in what's known as a fence line community. So their neighborhood, there's a fence basically um, around it where there's industry, big polluting industry, really on all sides. And in this community, there's a lot of um, unusual diseases and cancers. And these community members wanted to figure out why. So they created, um, there's sort of a do-it-yourself kind of way to sample air. It's with this bucket. They pump, it has a specialized bag in it. They seal it up. They pump out some air to make a vacuum. And then when they were ready, they open it. It sucks in air, an air sample for three minutes, and they send that to the lab. With this um, air sample, they were able, it, it came back from the lab showing exceedingly high levels of benzene. They were able to get funding with their state agency to set up more sampling to triangulate on which of the many industries there was actually releasing the benzene. Because our Environmental Protection Agency was inspecting all of the factories scheduled, they would schedule an inspection, go to the factory, nobody was releasing benzene. Finally, they started doing um, unplanned inspections because of this study. And they found um, the culprit, which was Tonawanda Coke factory. And this man here on the right was the first time ever in, in US history, the first time that someone was sentenced to jail and convicted in criminal court and served time in jail for polluting. In the past, it always had been the activists going to jail for protesting pollution. And this time with the data, partly from citizen science and other efforts, um, someone was convicted um, for polluting. 
uh, in a, another area is in my home state, <clears throat> which is, this is an example of what's termed environmental racism, um, is with our hog farms. And so in this aerial view here, each of those buildings look like what's on the right. They contain thousands of hogs. And um, these are out in the rural areas. And there's basically now more hogs in the state than people. And they produce an enormous amount of sewage, but there's no sewage treatment plants. Um, instead, the waste is pumped out of these um, barns and into these holding ponds that are only about 30 feet deep. And the wells in this area can be as low as short as 15 feet. Um, as these ponds fill up, the water was being sprayed onto the surrounding fields. And you can see how green it is around, um, directly around the hog farm. And you can also see distance um, where other people live. And so as they were spraying the waste, people in the surrounding areas started to get ill. Um, not only did it smell horribly, being rained on with these urine and feces, but people were becoming sick. And so when they complained though to the government that there was a need for protection, the government said, well, you need to prove that it's a problem. So sometimes the burden of proof is on people and that's when they need access to citizen science to be able to provide that proof. And so in this case, it was a collaboration between community members and um, Steve Wing, the fellow here in the middle, who is a professor of public health um, at a local university. And Gary Grant at the top was a community organizer uh, and Naima Muhammad, um, also a community organizer. And while Steve Wing placed these um, air pollution sensors in neighborhoods that were being affected, Naima taught people how to do a standard protocol where they would go outside for 10 minutes to breathe the air and then take these measurements of their health in the most objective ways possible with time stamp data, saliva samples, blood pressure that's time stamped, respiratory capacity, all those kind of things. They put those together and they could see that when the prevailing winds were bringing um, the air pollutants from the farms onto people, their health measurements went way low. When the prevailing winds changed and was blowing in so that they didn't have those pollutants, their health measurements went up. They published papers on this. They also looked at the patterns of where these hog farms were, which I show on a map on the lower right. And those areas, that's considered the black belt of North Carolina. It's areas where um, that are predominantly black and poor. Um, and that's why it was considered a environmental um, racism. And so with that information, they were able to get a moratorium on these spray fields. Um, and actually it's still an, uh, an active and ongoing battle. But my point was to illustrate times when people need access to uh, scientific information. Um, so really what I wanna um, wrap up with is this great paper by Finn Danielson and his colleagues, where they review studies that were that have led to changes and policy changes that protect the environment based on environmental monitoring. And what they compare is, is examples where scientists carry out the monitoring all by themselves compared to when they work with communities and there's some kind of participatory or citizen science happening. And what they see is that on the X axis there, that the time from when the monitoring begins to when there's some kind of decision or change, that varies. So if it's only scientists involved, that can take years, sometimes decades before something happens. But when it does happen, it's very big. You can look at the Y axis. It's regional, it's national, it's sometimes international, right? It can be a, a climate change treaty <laughs> or listings of, protect, of endangered species. On the other hand, when people are involved, the time from when information and monitoring starts happening until decisions start being made, that's very quick. It can be less than a year, but the scale is very small. It can be people making a change, like not using single-use plastics. It can be at the village or a district level. 
Now, my point that I want to emphasize is that if we want to have a comprehensive way to manage our natural resources, to conserve our biodiversity, then we need to operate at all spatial and temporal scales. So we need scientists and we need citizen scientists. We need large scale citizen science. We need small scale citizen science. We need to bring out every tool there is towards figuring out how we live together on the planet. I, um, so I can end there because I'm looking at the time and I want to be sure to have time for questions or I could go a little bit more. <laughs> so I, I want the facilitator to tell me if I should just conclude with a little more or if I should stop here. Um, Karen, maybe five minutes more. Okay, I can do that. Yep. Thanks. So, cause I, sometimes I'll end with the cartoons to sort of tie it all together. And so one thing I like to point out about citizen science is again, to look at history and to say that we can look at humanity and the way we have progressed to be like at this pinnacle of comfort and, and health. And it's a lot of it is by, there's been so many efforts to restrict the spread of knowledge and we've progressed by reducing those restrictions. So just some examples through history. So Michael Servetus, he was the first, and this is like the 1500s, he was the first person to correctly describe our pulmonary system and how blood circulates through the heart and the lungs. But he published this work in a book called The Restoration of Christianity, which was considered heresy. And so the church, the Catholic church, uh, they took what they thought was the last copy of his book and they tied it to his leg, they tied him to a stake, and they burned him alive. Three copies survived, um, and they actually became the founding doctrine of the Unitarian Church. Um, and, and so his science also survived with that. Um, similarly, almost 100 years later, Galileo, you know, subscribed to this view of the solar system, um, where the planets went around the sun, also frowned upon knowledge. I mean, that knowledge was frowned upon. And so he was under house arrest um, until he died. Um, and, and the thing is, is that that kind of, you know, it used to be maybe perhaps challenges between religion and science, but the spread of knowledge production is still restricted when we think about paywalls and where the scientific literature is behind paywalls. And so there's been activists like Aaron Schwartz, who as a young kid developed Reddit. As a young adult, he was a advocate for um, open science. Uh, he went um, onto MIT's campus in 2011 and started releasing all the science that was behind in JSTOR, you know, behind the paywall, releasing it to the public as a political statement. He violated copyright laws and uh, really they threw the book at him and they weren't letting him plea bargain. He was facing years, decades perhaps in prison and sadly, tragically under that pressure, he committed suicide. Um, and that, you know, now there's Sci Hub. It's also this Robin Hood kind of thing um, of, of that. But anyway, my main point here is that these can all seem radical and problematic to just how we spread existing knowledge. With citizen science, we're not talking about the spread of existing knowledge. We're talking about opening up and not restricting knowledge production and letting people into that system. And so this is sort of my cartoons of how we open that system. So the story of citizen science will be told by stick people with the following disclaimers that we do not only represent skinny people like sticks, nor white people, nor only uh, bald people, but we're generic stick people. We're representing humans of every shape and age, ethnicity, race, gender. And we tell the story because at our core, we're the same. And many people wonder where does knowledge come from? And in the status quo, scientists make knowledge inside this black box that's not accessible to people. And then we rely on science communicators 
to translate and deliver the knowledge into the everyday language of stick people. So here a scientist comes out and says, here's new research on avian olfactory receptor gene repertoires, which is a title of a paper by a colleague of mine, um, which means birds can smell. But with citizen science, we tear down the black box and we work together because we have a lot in common. We all make observations. We're all curious. We can all experiment in different ways. We all like to think and to wonder about the world around us. We all can be creative. We're all motivated to figure things out for discovery. And we all enjoy doing things, many of which dovetail with scientific activities. And we all like to share what we know and what we see in different ways. And when we face big problems, right, like climate change, uh, biodiversity conservation, just being handed this knowledge is not really enough. We need each other and that social capital that we develop when we make knowledge together to discover and use the knowledge to find solutions. And I think that moving forward, that sharing what we observe, that will just be a part of everyday life and what it means to be a responsible person on this planet, taking part in the decisions about how we live on this planet together. So thanks, I just wanna thank my lab and my students um, in the public science cluster. And with that, I'll, I'll close and take questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen. There were so many uh, important and um, you know, mind-expanding points in your, your talk. I think that um, uh, there's several things that we can relate to very well here in India. Uh, the, the broader point about uh, the environmentalism of the privileged being different from the environmentalism of the marginalized and, and how we really need to keep that in mind and, and uh, in, in the work that we do. And, and this, this opening up of knowledge production uh, and, the, and the collaborative aspects that you talked about. I think they're really... Um, so I will, um, we have about 15 minutes for questions. So thanks uh, Karen for, uh, for leading us this time. Um, okay, uh, the first uh, question has been answered actually uh, by Shaunak who said, uh, uh, asked whether Matthew Maury's chart is in the public domain and he found out the answer himself. And he says it's just incredible, and he's put a link on the on the chat on the channel. So um, there we are. Um, a couple of people, Sham and uh, Lorises, who I think is Kaberi, um, commented on the use of the term citizen science versus community science, um, and asked what your take is on this. Shall we continue to use citizen science or community science? Perhaps you could you could address that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a controversy here in the United States, um, mostly because of our current political climate, which is very anti-immigration, like in terms of our dominant, like uh, our current administration. And so um, there's a lot of oppressions now based on citizenship status. And so there's concern that using the term citizen science might exclude people who are vulnerable based on their citizenship status. Um, and I do think, uh, yeah, so I'm torn about it because on a global scale, citizen science, that term is being used. It's in federal law. Like there's been so much progress made. Um, and I don't, I almost don't wanna hand that, I wanna claim that term for, cause we don't mean citizenship in it. In that legal definition in the US, there is no citizenship requirement. And it's very clear that way. Um, but there's still that perception and it's problematic. Um, the thing with calling it community science is that community science, it, I feel like it would be co-opting that term because community science means grassroots. It means that it's driven by the people in the community. And so I wouldn't wanna call something that wasn't driven by the community, I wouldn't want to call that community science. Um, so anyway, I, it's a good point that the terminology is problematic, and I think it's going to take a, a lot of conversations to figure out what works best. 
Great, thank you, uh, Karen. Um, a couple of questions about the uh, the legal definition of, of citizen science. Nandini asks uh, a few related questions. Does the U.S. government's uh, definition of citizen science give the discipline any advantages? Does it make it easier for data to feed into policy, or are there more funds made available? And uh, she also asks, uh, related to that, is the accuracy of data collection an issue uh, when citizen science projects are carried out specifically to gather evidence for legal purposes, for, for, for a case, a litigation, for example? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so the federal law makes it clear that our federal agencies are allowed to carry out citizen science and crowdsourcing. So it was mostly for that. And we have, and a lot of our federal agencies have citizen science projects. Um, and so it was important to get that clarification in there. And then hopefully, um, like the, the law itself did not come with a budget or any kind of indication that it needs to be funded, but it basically makes it just um, permissible. So, um, and, it, and it elevates it as a legitimized way of producing new knowledge and informing policy. Um, but having said that, um, of the uses of citizen science, um, I used to think that publishing scientific papers was the hardest, but it's really not. We've made huge, huge headway into acceptance of citizen science as real science in terms of um, like sort of peer reviewed publications and in the ways that we've addressed data quality. There's been a lot of research on how to ensure data quality with citizen science data. Um, but when it comes to that regulatory aspect and um, policy aspect, it's still much harder. And um, I mean, it's just rapidly developing. So I would just say it's still incredibly challenging. Um, and I think that we're starting to see some shifts um, in, you know, that might open some doors, uh, especially with um, low cost sensors, right? Because if we can calibrate them and if they can provide reliable information, um, then people can trust them uh, more than they might trust, uh, you know, and not think that there's some distortion based on um, personal interests. So anyway, it's a complex area also, um, but I think it's one that's it's just rapidly changing. Great, thanks, Karen. There's a question from Prabhakar uh, who says in the tide monitoring data across the Atlantic, would you call it citizen science? Uh, it's crowdsourced, but were they not paid for data collection? So I guess the question is if people get paid to collect data, is that still citizen science? Um, well, with the tide one, uh, I believe it was volunteers. Um, I don't think people were paid. Um, sometimes for some people, if they were harbor masters, it might have been they might have seen it as part of their job. I'm not quite sure. Um, but to get to your point, um, yeah, that's a good question. So there's some citizen science where people are paid in the sense that they're reimbursed for the costs. And this is particularly citizen science with marginalized communities because they bear a burden. So with the hog farm example, um, in many ways, people were considered human subjects of that research, even though you know they were participatory human subjects. And we have a tradition of compensating people who are subjects of research, compensating them with small amounts for their time. So if they are giving an hour of time, they're compensated, you know, with a wage for an hour. It's not like a job, you know, it's not a career track. But so there is, and I would still call that citizen science. Um, I've heard of citizen science efforts of data cooperatives, where people pool together data that they collect on a topic, and that's big data. You can sell that, right? If you sell it and then they share those profits. So there's different economic models, although I still think it's more common for people to actually pay in order to be part of a citizen science project. There's quite a few like that. Um, so uh, anyway, it can really vary. But I, I would still call it citizen science, even when there's whatever in the different ways that the economies might be involved. Great, thank you. Um, 
<clears throat> there are many, many compliments for your talk uh, in the in the chat, uh, Karen. I'm not going to read them. I'll leave you leave it to you to read them. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Farida uh, says, um, among other things, I feel that for India, we uh, need to add regional languages into the dialogue. Uh, because presently, most citizen science is still in English. Uh, but of course, as you know, Karen, um, uh, English is still a language of the elite here and, and um, mm -hmm. there are many, many Indian languages. So this is more a comment, I suppose. But perhaps <clears throat> if you have any experience with this, with, with language being a particular barrier or, or, a, or a way to open up citizen science in new communities, uh, maybe you could comment on that. Yeah, so I don't have... I, I don't have experience with that myself. Um, and it is um, it is definitely an area, I mean, language and inclusion, yeah, definitely go hand in hand. And so it is an issue here in the US too. Um, and I think some, and there are efforts um, to make citizen science more inclusive by making it, uh, you know, through multilingual, um, uh, efforts. Um, I mean, I guess even beyond or even before that, like even within the English language, there's a lot of science communication scholarship that is needed um, just, just so that people who aren't scientists can understand um, aspects of their engagement in a citizen science project. So, yeah, I mean, like a core part of citizen science. In some ways you could see it as simply a type of science communication around research, right? And it's an ongoing conversation of people providing information and scientists and their teams providing context and helping people make meaning of that information. And, and so yes, like communication is the core. And so, I mean, it is essential to address language issues, which I think um, they are an issue in the U.S., and it, I, I suspect in India it's more of an issue. Thank you. Uh, there's a <clears throat> question by Rajit, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase his question a little bit. Um, I think he's asking whether citizen science has played a role in uh, generating more love and respect for nature among Americans and encouraging them to take collective action. So actually, can citizen science also be a means toward uh, the end of getting more support uh, and action for nature? Yeah, and, and that, that is a common theme here is that it can help, um, help with that. And I think it does help with, I mean, I think there's some evidence that it helps with people um, seeing sort of everyday nature and um, nature around them, because there's so much place-based, like citizen science, right where people live. And so it makes nature conservation and environmental issues relevant to people's everyday lives. And I think that's very important. Um, but at the same time, I think um, there is a predisposition that the people who are volunteering for citizen science already have connections with nature, already have those environmental concerns. And so there's efforts um, with that I, I partner with efforts with Starter, um, there's to, uh, to reach, to work with organizations, kind of like third parties that help bring new audiences to citizen science so that, um, so that it isn't just sort of the preaching to the choir kind of thing that, um, so we have, for example, um, corporate volunteers. So we partner with companies who um, provide incentive programs for their staff. They allow their staff to do some volunteer hours and they can do volunteering for science. And that could be conservation oriented projects. And some of the things that we're studying is, does that move people along this spectrum of concern um, related to conservation issues? Um, and so I think it's still a bit of an open question is my point, like, because because of that predisposition that people bring. But there's certainly nothing wrong with rallying people who already have environmental concerns and, and increasing their engagement in ways that they can um, help with conservation efforts. Thank you. Um, we have a, a number of further questions. I'm going to uh, choose between them um, okay. and ask you if you can to respond to them later.
uh, the ones that we leave out. But there's one um, question by Prabhakar again, can you comment on citizen science and open data? And I guess that comes from the observation that uh, some citizen science projects are, uh, information comes from, from the public, but uh, the, the information generated isn't openly available. So yeah. what's your uh, view on that? Yeah, there's definitely this misconception <laughs> that, uh, and I think there's a desire for citizen science data to be open, um, which I think there's just a lot of education that needs to happen about what it means for data to be open. And it can be open and it can still protect the locations of people, it can protect the locations of sensitive species and still be open, right? There's ways to, to, to um, obscure the geographic locations, you know, with the, make them less precise. Um, but for data to really be open, it needs to be licensed in the Creative Commons or some other open data archive. Because um, the default is that it's copyright and that it's controlled. So I think it just, there's concerns. That's a big area <laughs> about how projects maintain their sustainability and can they be sustainable if they're open or do they need to um, you know, keep track of who uses the data? But I think open systems can allow for protecting data privacy, can allow for still controlling and uh, keep track of who's using it, how they're using it. So I think it, it can accommodate all of the concerns around open data. Um, but I think that people need to, I think there's just a lot of education around how to make that work. So um, right now, no, citizen science data are not all open. A lot of them are, but not all. Um, it's not necessarily the norm. Um, and uh, anyway, but it's definitely an area that I think it will start to open up as people understand those data management practices uh, better. Great, thank you. Um, we're just about out of time, but perhaps you can take one more uh, question from Loris's, uh, who I think I'm guessing is Kaveri. Um, <laughs> so. Could you um, please talk about evaluation methods of citizen science projects? Yeah, and, and evaluation is a key part because the field in some ways, even though it has this long history, it's so rapidly evolving. It's important that we continue to assess what works and what doesn't. Um, and I mean, there's been, yeah, so I don't know where to begin with that. Um, but I do think that it's important for projects to build in assessment into, into sort of the way things are done um, and not in like a necessarily burdensome way, but that, that but that to think of projects iteratively, um, even long-term projects that obviously need to have certain continuity in their protocols, but need to iterate early on to make, to see what works for people um, uh, and, and for assessing these learning outcomes. And just for, even for the sake of the project, being able to design it in a way so that, um, so that its impact can be documented well for the sustainability of that project itself. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely a key part. That's often, it's often an add-on. It needs to be designed into the project. Yes, but it, it is seen as a burden very often, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> yeah. People. Yes, yes. Good, I think we're about out of time. I mean, this has been such a pleasure uh, to have you with us, uh, Karen. And I think uh, you've left us with uh, lots and lots to, uh, to ponder over. There's been a couple of comments it said that um, uh, the people have to look at your video uh, multiple times to absorb everything <laughs> that you've, uh, you've said and all the sure. insights and wisdom in your presentation. So thank you again so very much. Um, and we hope to interact with you again in the future. Yeah, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. All right, bye. Um, so we're closing the session now, everyone. Uh, we will see you uh, again tomorrow at uh, 10 in the morning where Naveen Namudri will be talking with us. And in fact, I think we'll be following up very nicely from some of the things that Karen has spoken about, where he uh, will talk about uh, local action and local citizen science to tackle and raise information about local uh, resource issues. So I think that will follow very nicely from this talk. See you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye.